Hi. Thanks for being here today. Thanks to everyone who's here in the room, and thank you to our virtual audience uh, coming in from wherever you're coming in from. Appreciate you coming to another one of our sessions today. This is now our third session of the day for the Transforming Education Pillar of Penn State Startup Week. We've been trying to do a logical flow of, of uh, events and activities today, where we started out this morning with, uh, with Darren Coudre talking about the opportunities for entrepreneurship related to ed tech. And then we built up a little bit with, uh, with Lee Erickson talking about, all right, so if you are gonna go down this path, what are the mistakes? What are the things you need to avoid? Uh, she termed it, don't step in it. Now, we are uh, lucky enough to have with us the uh, creative director from uh, Outreach and Online Education here at Penn State. Uh, Herbert Reitinger is, is creative director, but he's much more than that. Uh, if you've had the opportunity of hearing Herbert speak either through one of his TED, TED Talks or through one of his YouTube videos, you know that there's this, this quiet strength, this quiet power in the presentations that he gives. He's able to take individuals and pull them in and help them to understand where his passion lies, why he's excited about what he's talking about. And for entrepreneurship, that's key. Because you can go to all the pitch deck sessions you want and put together a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. But if that's all you've got, that's all you've got. You need to be able to communicate your passion, communicate your idea. And that's what Herbert's here to talk about today. Herbert's a citizen of the world. He has had an enormous amount of experience working for a number of different agencies, traveled the world, has spoken on a number of diff different topics. If you've never heard his TED talk on uh, Water is One, I would highly recommend that you go on and watch that. But today he's going to be talking about best practices in presentation design and presentation. Persuasive speech, bring people along, and how do you do it? So please help me welcome Herbert, thank you. Well, thank you for being here on a day. When, as Brad said, when you do a pitch, you actually don't talk about what you know, but you need to tell people what they don't know yet. And that sort of reverses the whole flow of information. You should be aware that it doesn't matter what you say, but it matters what arrives on the other side of your conversation. And you know, we are human beings and we understand limitations. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So when you put together a pitch, there are seven simple rules to follow to make that pitch much more successful. Right, so let's get into this. First step, slides are not your documents. Slides are also not your presenter notes. Remember that. Don't write everything on a slide that you want to say. Tell stories. You see, I'm talking right now and you have a picture in the background that gives you a context of what this is about. But I'm not writing everything exactly what I'm saying because I want you to pay attention to me and not read on a slide because, because, there we go. So this is a typical PowerPoint slide that we see all the time. Now try to read and try to pay attention to me. Can you actually remember what you read and what I said at the same time? I bet you can. It's just not possible. We are not wired that way. So remember, a slide is really just background for you to set the mood of what you're saying. But your story should be the focus. In other words, practice your presentation until you're sure that what you say syncs with what you show on the slide. But don't make me read because, believe me, we can read faster than we can talk. So if you write everything on a slide that you're saying, I probably have already read all eight bullet points, 
still on bullet point for one and then I get bored and then I check my email I disconnect I'm not part of your story so what of pitch is this going to be it's unsuccessful right out of the gate so keep the slides simple put one thing on a slide maybe a picture maybe a short sentence but nothing else and talk to the person I don't know if you can read this it's a bit faint this is Richard Branson pretty famous guy sir Richard Branson he says too many people are hiding in dark rooms flipping through too many words on big screens and there's a reason why I avoid boardrooms boardrooms board rooms getting bored you see so what I have some interaction here what is he talking about anybody what is he actually suggesting here come on give me something yes please Did you hear that? There should be more action instead of just sitting around. Anything else? Um, you know, it's like narrative, how you're saying, instead of, you know, giving them the story. You'll get the price. Yes, that's very true. The narrative is your story. It's not your slides. It's your story. And it's the passion that you put into that story. So also try... I'm walking around, you see? I'm focusing your attention on me because I'm walking, right? And I make pauses, I have an accent. It makes you pay attention even more, right? And as I'm telling the story, I can paint pictures in your mind. And that is much more powerful than slides with many bullet points. Second, point use of pictures a picture says a thousand words we know that we look at pictures first you probably couldn't really see it it's a bit faint here but this picture child with big eyes looking at you the mouth is sort of full of of, uh, of food around and has a spoon in its mouth that has a certain expression. It's endearing. And that message can be used to support the story. But be very careful uh, that you don't create a contrast or a conflict between the story that you're telling and the pictures that you show. Make sure that the picture supports your story, does not contradict your story. Because the point is, don't divert my attention from the story. Here is an example that does not work that well. What story is this picture telling? Literally, the people are just sitting, posing, right? Please try to avoid stock photos if you can. It's very easy to pull free stock photos from somewhere, but stock photos are just that, they're generic. If the story is a bland one, maybe this picture works, especially if it's in black and white, but in general, if you are walking up to the stage with all your pouring your heart in, that picture may not work. So choose your pictures wisely because they, pay, they tell a story on their own, right? Now, this is Sheryl Sandberg, COO of Facebook. She says, I encourage people not to prepare formal PowerPoint presentations things with me. What does that mean? Can somebody help me here? What is she actually saying? What does she want in a meeting with her? Anybody?
Good point. Did you all hear that? Better to have a discussion about something instead of passively taking in a PowerPoint presentation with all the words written on all the slides, right? Anybody else wants to share something? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Too much time wasted in preparing this PowerPoint presentation. Let's just talk about it. What do I need a PowerPoint presentation about the subject that we actually need to discuss? It's not that I just put my opinion out and you just have to accept it. There should be a conversation, right? That's what Jerry Seinberg says, and apparently they are very successful in what they're doing. Number three, please keep it simple. Your overarching goal or strategy for any presentation that you create is three words. Don't make me think. Okay, four words. <laughs> Don't make me think. Keep it so simple that I can follow you. So if something on a slide that is complex, complicated, like charts with several different layers and, uh, and a legend next to it that is like 15 levels deep and everything else, I will, because I'm a nice person, I will try to understand that. Because you have thought about it, you've put it up there, you want me to see it, but while I do that, I will not listen to your story. Because remember, I can't do both. I can't read and listen at the same time. So if your slide is complicated, you better don't talk at that time. You could say, check out this graph that I put up for you. It's immensely complicated and I'm going to stop talking for five minutes to give you time to actually comprehend it. Because if you don't do that, you may not put that slide up in the first place. What's the point? You confuse the people. Keep it simple. Who knows what the noise ratio is. Anybody? Signal to noise ratio? Okay. Other stuff, yes. I don't know if you heard uh, how much actual information do you cover up by, by uh, a quantity of additional information that has no relevance to that point that you're trying to make. Signal to noise ratio. You know, this old radio, I don't know if you're old enough to understand how this worked. You could move the dial to get the station clear into the reception. If you turn it a little bit, the noise will increase. The more you turn, the more noise you get, and eventually, the signal is completely gone and they have just noise. Not a good idea, right? You just ramble and ramble and ramble and ramble and ramble and people start checking their phones because they check out. So keep the signal to noise ratio really low, ideally to zero. Focus on your message and remove anything that shouldn't be there. That's a Steve Jobs quote, by the way. Remove anything that shouldn't be there. Be really hard with yourself. Do I really need this to support my story? If not, remove it. And here's an example. Awesome example, lots of text, different colors, different fonts. A cat photo has to be there, right? And all kinds of other things. What, what is this about? If you make a slide like this, probably get smiles from your audience, but they will not understand what you're talking about. But because I'm talking about signal to noise ratio, I thought I need to show you that. So in other words, it fits my story. You see? It fits my story. 
and that is important to remember. It needs to fit your story. Jeff Weiner, as I would pronounce it, says, we eliminated presentations. Materials are sent out 24 hours in advance. So we can learn about it and then have a meaningful conversation. Do you think that will work? Would that work for us? This is a good idea, not a good idea. Any suggestions? Go for it. I would think that um, it has to become part of the culture of the organization, sort of the expectation of the organization that this is how we're going to behave. Right. And it could work. If everybody is prepared for that and knows that I should be watching for the materials, I need to carve out time to prepare myself, okay. But if one, one person is using this strategy and another person is using a completely different strategy, then you're going to have confusion. But you know, Jeff is the CEO of LinkedIn, so it's easy. He just requests and everybody will follow suit, right? I think I would love that if we had that culture here, because then we come together, we understand what we're talking about instead of being caught on the spot, having to make a decision on the spot and then feeling bad if I disagree while the whole room actually agrees. It would help me to, to be able to voice my concerns, but not everybody can think on their feet also. There are people need time to reflect and understand, and so by giving them the information in advance, all these opportunities are there, and we can have a meaningful conversation, pro and con and everything it takes. Yes, sir. I think a, a point here for the context of entrepreneurs and, and individuals starting this is that they're very often presenting to companies that are not their own. They're presenting to a VC or, or to another organization. Sure. So I think a key point that you just made there is understanding what the culture is within those that are going to be receiving this. Very good point. So mm -hmm. if it is, uh, I, I'll, I'll use IBM as an example because I've been working with them a fair yeah. amount. They are text heavy, 50 bullet points per slide. Uh, that is the expectation and the culture there. And as an individual <laughs> going to them looking for funding, grants, whatever it may be, you have to follow that culture to a certain extent. You can only push back so much. But if I were, if I were uh, pitching something to LinkedIn, if, they, if yeah. I was looking for some capital from them, I might take that as a cue of, Yes. This is how I may go about this. I'm not going to send them a PowerPoint deck with 50 bull bullets per. per Does point. everybody understand what Brad was saying? Do you want to respond something to it? Wait for a microphone if you want to say it so that people online can hear. Is that a good idea what Brad just said? Yeah? Well, me as a creative director, <laughs> My number one rule for anything I do is first break all the rules. <laughs> but, you know, I understand not everybody can do that. But you as startup entrepreneurs, excited and motivated, you are free to break any established rules because innovation by definition includes breaking established rules. So, just make up your own decision how you deal with existing cultures where you go and do your pitch. Now, number four. The consistency of your story is super important. And here I would like to suggest to all of you, don't start your pitch in PowerPoint or Keynote or any other of these applications that work with the metaphor of slides. Don't start there. Write on a piece of paper, here is the storyline that I want to tell. And here's the outcome of what I want the people to remember after I have left the room. 
Just write it down on a piece of paper. Or use sticky notes, even better. Because then you can move the sticky notes around in, in the sequence. Look at that and say, that's a clear line. This reflects exactly what I want to say. And then go into PowerPoint and every sticky note becomes a slide. If you start in PowerPoint, you don't have that wider view that you can then move things around accordingly so your storyline becomes obvious. PowerPoint forces you into linear thinking. Storytelling most of the time is not linear. And we are used to hearing stories more than a linear chain of thought. Consistency also indicates don't mix things between slides in terms of, of style. Different fonts, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. Not a good idea. If your deck is consistent, as you can see, my title slides, on every step there is a consistency throughout. But in that consistency, you can create variations, for example, in color, in terms of background. But you still understand this is the same story. I hope so. So consistency is really important because you can easily confuse people by copying, pasting slides from different presentations, and then nothing fits together, and it feels that way. It's sort of not really thought through. So, let's have a look. Oh, Finn, 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 come here for a second. I need your help with my presentation. All right, all right. Um, what do you need? Tell me what you think. Okay. Here, I'll skip okay. the intro and get to the good stuff, right? Uh, right, yeah, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Slide 126, 127, 128, whoa, 120. Whoa, 120. whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah. how, uh, how many slides are in this presentation? 317. This thing is awesome. It's got everything. Slides 26 through 135 are simply productivity charts. I've stunned you into silence. Well, <laughs> uh, listen, Bob. How, um, how long is this presentation? Eight and a half by 11? No, no, no. Uh, how, um, how much time do you have? Oh, oh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. You think I need more slides? Um, I'll put in more slides. Well, uh, Bob, 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 Bob. Do you think maybe it's about um, four times too long? Hmm. Maybe you're right. I know exactly what I'll do. Oh, good, good. So, um, what are you going to take out? Take out? Take out? No, 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 no. I'm not taking anything out. This is corporate gold. I'm leaving it all in. I'm just going to talk four times faster. Really? How are you going to do that? Oh, it's easy. Like this. One score eight years ago, this company was founded. It was 1989. Who would have imagined way back then the heights to which we would one day soar? Speaking of course of our last fiscal quarter, which was really amazing, the month of June was, in particular, an amazing month. By the months of July and August were even better. During this presentation, I will be taking you through each day of this incredibly awesome fiscal quarter so that you can experience the milestone in its fullness. Let's begin in the beginning. June 1st, 2011. Sales to Western Region top $4,200. Don't worry about the slide count. Make the slides count. Quote Nancy Duarte. You should Google her, Nancy Duarte. Much of what I'm telling you here, I learned from her and a little bit from others also. I will show you later. But Nancy Duarte has really started that drive to get rid of bullet points in presentations all together. Who needs bullet points? Get rid of it. Right. Here's Jeff Bezos, head of Amazon.com. All of our meetings are structured page narrative. It forces deeper clarity. So based on those quotes from famous people, 
how do you think this quote of Jeff Bezos relates to everything else we already have heard? Richard Branson, Sheryl Sandberg, Jeff Weiner. Is this in sync with it or is this a completely different request asking for here? Yes, please. Hold on a second. Microphone's coming. He's asking for concision. Right. Being short, sweet, to the point. But why, why do you think he is asking for six pages? That's a lot, right? It depends on the company. Some, some company right. cultures could have average of 10 or 20 slide presentations. Uh -huh. And if, if they're all in the same structure, it makes it easy for people to follow along, even if, if it's two or three slides, but it's not in a way that people can understand, then it's not efficient. But mm -hmm. if it's the same six page narrative memo that everybody can read and understand, then it'd be more efficient for the company. Thank you. Anybody else over there? Brad, Brad gets workout. Thank you. Um. He wants a narrative to keep people engaged. Thank you. This is an awesome point. You want to keep the audience engaged. You're not just talking to the wall or to whomsoever. You're talking to a person. Right? Remember that. Eye contact, attention contact, talking to somebody, pointing to somebody bringing the people into the conversation. This is why I'm asking you for your opinion right now, because otherwise you could just watch a video of me talking and you have no way to respond. It should be a conversation. I'll, I'll add in that six page narrative memo says to me, uh, first of all, the person calling the meeting has thought through what are we doing here? Right. Uh, so that there's a point to it. But a narrative memo allows me to tell a story. Yes. The story of why we're here. Whereas a PowerPoint can be a number of facts that are regurgitated out into this yes. paradigm of PowerPoint. Yes. But a narrative memo lets me say, this is why I think we should be talking today. This is what we're talking about. This is where I think we could be going. And, and to get all of that out and get everyone else uh, yeah. primed up for that meeting so it can be productive. Thank you, Brad. This is a good point. I would like to leave some time at the end of this so we can have more conversations. So I am moving on. Showing data clearly. Now that's an interesting point because when there is, like Brad said, 15 bullet points on a slide and each one has a data point. 15% here, 25,000, items here and then 0.001% over there, at some point you cannot comprehend all of it. Remember, we are conditioned to recall emotions and empathy much more than facts. So if you tell me that this 15% created 5,000 happy, smiling customers. I remember the happy, smiling, and maybe I remember the 5,000, but the 15% I already forgot. So be very careful how you present data. Give me one data point per slide, like this one. Americans own 81 million cats. And the cat photo fits right into this picture. Cat photo is anyway is a good idea, right? Uh, so make it really simple and make the point that you're making as big as you can. Don't hide it into a 12-point font. It's about font size, by the way. You should know your target audience that you talk to. So if these are people like my age, you, the, the rule of thumb is make the font size 
the size of the median age in the audience. So the median age here may be, including me here, 35 to 40. So your font size should be 40 points. You can't make 15 bullet points on one slide using a 40 point font. Because these people there in the back not read tiny little text. And if they can't read it, then why do you put it there? Remember what shouldn't be there should be removed. Focus on one concept per slide. Don't put everything at the kitchen sink on the same slide. Even if you tell a story, focus. Focus on one idea so I can remember what you said. Seth Godin, if you haven't followed his blog, I encourage you to do so. The cost of being wrong is less than the cost of doing nothing. Now that's a very smart sentence. I want to hear what you make of that. Do you understand it? What is he saying here? What is he saying? Anybody? Yes, Larry? So I, I take that as saying um, we, we have to be trying something even if we're going to fail, <coughs> but what we can learn from that failure is going to have value. If we do nothing, there's no learning going on. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody disagrees? Okay, we're all in sync, it seems. Good. Now comes the really important part. Have you heard about the golden circle concept? Anybody has heard? Good, thank you. You too? Did you raise your hand? Yeah, thank you. Simon Sinek did an amazing TED Talk uh, quite some years ago, it has like 24 million views right now, and he says, anything you do, including a pitch, you should start with the why, and then talk about how and then what you do. In general, we always start on the other end. We know what we're doing, but we don't quite really know why we're doing it. So. Here's an excerpt. Of About this. three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. 
They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done, that's how most sales is done, and that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do, we say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage, it has, you know, leather seats, buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell, Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. So I pulled out one of these key quotes here. People don't buy what you do, they buy you do it. Just imagine how that would change the narrative of your pitch. So it's not what idea do you have. And then how do you implement it in your startup? It starts with the why. Start with the why. Be passionate about why you want to do what you're doing. And talk about it. Let the people understand this is your passion. And then go through the how and then what actually will be done. I just let this sink in for a moment because it literally reverses the way we normally do things, right? Okay, number seven. Don't read from your slides. I can read faster than you can talk. Tell a story. Insert a black screen and I'm going to tell a story. When I was in first grade, our tried to explain to us numbers from one to hundred. I had no idea what she was talking about. One to hundred. I mean, I could count probably to seven or something like that. One to hundred, way too much. And one day she came with a really long, that high, and 10 meters long. Meters, right? I'm from meters land. 10 meters long, put it up on the wall, and then she went and colored every section from 1 to 10, from 11 to 20, from 21 to 30, with a different color. And suddenly I realized that 
I can put this all next to each other. There's a logical sequence. But as a side effect, when you tell me today 56, I see that color. That 56 has that color from that meter band, which is a different color from 79. So stories have impact. It paints pictures in people's heads. Tell stories. People remember stories. People don't remember facts that much. Every slide a fact, and after the 20th slide, I don't remember what I saw in the first one. But a continuous red thread of a story is very easy to remember. So when you tell a story, make sure it focuses on you. Maybe I could influence how you remember colors. <laughs> Let's see. Right. A summary. We have all suffered through presentations that are really PowerPoint read-alongs where the audience completely tunes out. But used the right way, slides can actually make your ideas stand out and be remembered. My firm helps companies create persuasive presentations and we've created over a quarter of a million of them. And here's how we approach slide development. First, we use slides selectively. If you're in a small informal setting, we encourage clients to ditch the slides. Instead, spend time shaping a conversation. Use the whiteboard or prepare a few graphics to collaborate around. It's easier to make a personal connection without slides in the mix. Second, we write the slides after we've prepared the speech. When you're creating a presentation, it's going to be really tempting to dive right into the slide software. But that software forces you to think about your content linearly and in small chunks. Instead, hammer out what you want to say and then think about the visuals that you need <coughs> to support it. That way, you're going to craft your whole message instead of little bitty slide parts. Next, we create slides that people can understand in three seconds. People can only process one stream of information at a time. So if your slide is too complicated, they're going to be reading it instead of listening to you. So you need to simplify the visual content by only putting elements on the slide that are there for the audience to help remember what you've said. To keep slides simple, we storyboard one concept per slide. If you absolutely need to have more than one concept on a slide, use a build so that people won't be distracted by too much information at once. Before you open up your slide software, sketch out your slides on post-it notes. The tiny size constraint will force you to simplify them and then it lets you rearrange them really easily. And finally, remember that slides are a visual medium. Use an informative diagram, an interesting chart, or a photograph that helps make your point. Don't just project the words that you're saying aloud onto a giant screen. If you really want people to have an outline of what you're saying, then just give them a handout. With a little bit of thoughtful preparation of your visuals, we can stop boring presentations and make your next speech more persuasive. So, I am actually good in time, so we have a little time to have a conversation, but I also have a postscriptum, or as Steve Jobs says, one more thing. It will take about two minutes to go through that. Shall we do that? Just to drive the point home, or the points that you just learned about, Let's look at this famous gentleman. You remember the famous speech at Gettysburg? Let's listen to it. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty, and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. 
it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. One of the most famous speeches ever given in this country. Did you feel goosebumps towards the end? Now, <laughs> what I'm showing you now is uh, from one of the vice presidents from Google. What would happen if I made a PowerPoint presentation out of the speech? I just take an existing template, use very nice animations and put the points in bullet points on the screen. Uh, who is on my Mac? Can you just click through in a good sequence? So there's everything that Abraham Lincoln said. But where is the magic of the words? Where are the goosebumps? How on earth can a PowerPoint presentation translate what Abraham Lincoln actually said? Scores of, of scholars have analyzed the speech. I mean, just imagine that. It's just a few minutes long, right? And this here, would not be worth analyzing because it doesn't really tell a story. So that brings me to the end of my little show and tell. And we have about 10 minutes time. What does this mean for you? Have you learned something that you didn't know before? Would that change your approach? Can you give me some feedback, please, or ask any questions that you may have? We have a microphone here. Um, it's definitely going to change my approach to how I create a presentation, because I never thought of writing out a narrative before. I always go straight for the PowerPoint, mm -hmm. and then try to, as you said, construct it linearly. So that's definitely one of the takeaways from this presentation. Thank you. Anybody else? Do you have any questions? Sorry. <coughs> Here. And if you're watching online, if you have any questions, Brad will relate them to us. Please. How do you present when you have many facts that you have to share to the audience? You said three? Three facts? Many facts. Oh, many facts, okay. How do you do a presentation without bullet points? I mean, without, you, do you know what I, what I mean? <laughs> right. Because you, you have facts, you have to share the facts, but then. Give me an example of some of the facts. I don't know, let's say how many. Hmm? Like about poverty reduction, how many poor people? Poor countries right. in the world. Right, right. You have to give some facts, and then you want to dive into another topic. You have to give right. other facts. Right. I would recommend not knowing exactly what uh, what you're trying to express, 
to focus on the results of the, or the impact of the facts instead of the facts alone. Because if you just tell me the facts, you make me think. W what does this actually mean? But if you tell me, if we increase donations to South Sudan by 10%, 30 million children don't have to die this year. Well, you got my attention by that, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, you want 10% increase in donations. So give me the results of the facts, because they become an emotional impact story. The facts are mental, and we sort of forget about those. But 30 million kids die every year in South Sudan? Mm. I, I can't even start to imagine that we are not doing that, right? If you have a lot of facts, maybe you can create a summary, you know, raise it up one level. What does this all mean? You know, for example, you <coughs> sorry, you go here to Penn State and you study, possibly. Uh, you go to, through many courses, you have lots of tests, but in the end of the day, you graduate. And that matters to a potential employer or to somebody that you pitch, now you have a P behind your name, right? Nobody will ask how many courses did you take, how long does it take, what's your GPA and on and so forth. The fact, one fact is I have that PhD and everybody understands it took a lot of work. You don't need to tell me every step. So keeping it simple and focus would be my suggestion not just lay it out for me and then pick and choose, because I will not do that. Hi. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> what, do you, what are some best practices, or how do you feel about using presenters' notes in PowerPoints or in... Or in um, I didn't understand the last part. What oh, are the best um, practices? Presentation on? notes. So like in Keynote, when you have the yeah. front-facing slide, yes. but then behind the scenes yeah. you have your notes. So you have one image that can create emotional connection. Right. But then if you don't know the content, if you're reading literally from a slide, mm -hmm. then you're, you're losing potential engagement. So how do, you question. how do you balance that when you don't know the material that well? Maybe you're... Right. Or you're nervous. <laughs> yes. So the question, remember what you want to say. And there are two ways of doing this. One, practice, practice, practice. Then you don't need presenter notes. You just know the story that you're talking about. Like the story of the meter band, I don't need notes for that because I know the story. I can see it in my head. But PowerPoint and Keynote and the online versions of those two, they all have that feature of presenter notes. Write your presenter notes in short, memorable snippets. Don't write everything word for word that you're saying, because then they're glued to a screen and you're reading. But the quick glance gives you the next thought that you should be talking about, and the next thought. Like this, you will never lose your red thread. So use your presenter notes. If you have a second screen or you present from your laptop to a big screen, you can put the presenter notes on your small screen. Or many times I use my phone. You can drive a PowerPoint or keynote presentation from your phone. And you have your presenter notes here and you have the next slide next to it so you know exactly where to go with it. Use it if you're not sure how your story flows. Yes, Larry. So, Herbert, I'm wondering if you could tell us a story <laughs> about a time where you failed in a presentation. Right. And what was your lesson? What did you take away? Like, what was maybe one of the worst things that you ever did? And then what did you learn from that? Right. Okay. Um, that's an easy one. Uh, there's another thing you need to be aware of and that is technology. We take things for granted, but actually there is bet on it that something will go wrong. 
You can bet on it. Even today it happened. Something will not work as expected. It could be the connection doesn't work, it could be your battery runs out, it could be the sound isn't there, whatever it is, be sure that something will go wrong and then generate confidence out of it. So in this case, to answer your question, uh, everything failed. I had nothing on the screen, I had no presenter notes, I was on stage, focus was on me, and I had not practiced my presentation enough. I was relying on my notes, and they were gone. So I had to wing it, and you know winging, you understand, right? And I forgot the most important part of that story. It was a terrible experience. So what I learned from there is have a plan B. Have a piece of paper in your back pocket with your most salient talking points. If everything fails, fails, pull out the paper. Doesn't matter, right? And refresh your memory. Because the most important thing to be forgotten is equals not to have a picture at all. What's the point, right? So have a plan B. Herbert, Anything can else? I follow up on that for a second? Because I think it's also really important. It's over here. Oh, you. So I think um, important to, you know, not use, to know the presentation outside of the presentation and be able to speak without that technology. But even the, the content that you put in the presentation, you know, don't use, don't use that video as an end all be all and as a crutch because when, the, when it doesn't play, that, that can't be the okay. point you end it on, or that can't be how you drive it home. If you can't do that yourself, whenever the technology fails, yes. then you're left standing there kind right. of, you know, in a rut. So that's a statement, right? right. Another question. Yeah. 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 And I fully agree. Um, how, do you, oops, how do you balance between being rehearsed in what you're doing and then sounding robotic and you're reading off a script? Uh, <clears throat> If I sounded robotic here, I have to apologize because that's not my intention. I definitely make every effort to be passionate, to be relevant, and to be engaging with the audience. If I would stand here and I have my text here, and I'm going to read to you one page after the other and I don't move and I'm just reading. That's not a conversation, right? So I would avoid my body language being static. I would avoid keeping my tone of voice static. It puts you all to sleep, you know, if I keep talking like this for an hour or two and I'm not moving and eventually the slides get complicated and you're checking your phone, you're checking out, right? So if I want to make an important point, I drive it towards you. I can't be robotic on that. I have to move forward and give it to you so that you can receive it. So having the audience with me is a key point in anything that you, you do when you talk to somebody. One-on-one, -on -one, a presentation, a pitch, anything you do. Brad is giving me the sign we are out of time. Well, thank you so much. It's awesome. I'm so passionate about it. I'm glad we could have this conversation. If you have any questions, then Brad will give us some hints how we can continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. Thank you, Herbert.